I know we say it all the time. Oh, this comedian was unique, a pioneer, first of his time, but with Mitch Hedbeck, oh boy, he was a true unicorn. I've had four AIDS tests in my day. The AIDS test is very scary to get. It doesn't matter what you've been doing. Waiting for the results is frightening. So I don't get the regular AIDS test anymore. I get the roundabout AIDS test. I call my friend Brian. I said, Brian, do you know anybody who has AIDS? <laughs> no? Cool. Comedy Kings, Comedy Kings. Network. Network. Times Magazine deemed Mitch the next Shinefield, a title he adored and pursued by trying to go to the sitcom industry, but he still conflicted with the culture at the time. He told our stand that he didn't like any of the scripts written for him, and one guy approached him and said, I see you as a tennis coach. Howard playfully replied, I see you playing a drug addict. More friction built on his Hollywood goal because of his no advice policy. He puts it as, you can't learn funny, and a lot of advice comes from people who aren't funny. He didn't want to compromise his persona, which was always trouble for him, as most directors, writers, and producers exactly want to do that. This confliction led him to create his own movie, Los Enchiladas, which he wrote, directed, produced, and also starred in. Ironically, he advised his wife not to take advice from anyone, as he said on a radio interview called What's So Funny. Moving on, Mitch practiced free writing, a technique where you write anything that comes to mind, even though it doesn't make any sense. It's like a form of meditation where the essential thoughts are not only observed but also enhanced. I used this technique to come up with the following lines. I realized that we only found out that Mitch free writes because his free writing book was found and publicly shared. But while I was free writing, all I could think of was, God damn, I hope nobody finds this. I even thought of literally bending the script afterwards. And hey, don't ask me why. Just try it. Anyway, this is his free writing, which translates to, pause the screen if you want to see. By the way, I'm not going to try the heroin or cocaine so that I can get that authentic Mitchell Beck writing experience. Speaking of writing, Joe Rogan said that his jokes were silly and genius at the same time. He went on saying that his favorite Mitchell Beck joke was, My friend asked me if I want a frozen banana. I said no, but I want a regular banana later. So yeah. Speaking of headback jokes, it doesn't take the keenest side to see that his jokes were family friendly, which seems out of place for a guy like Mitch Headback. In contrast to the vast majority of modern stand-up comedy, his jokes didn't include race, gender, nor politics. Moreover, they were not self-deprecative like those of Rodney Dangerfield. Moving on, Mitch sparked a controversial topic that even stole the eye of the astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. In a recent podcast with Joe Rogan, Dr. Tyson brought Headback's name up as they discussed the use of drugs in generating new ideas and perspectives. Jerry Cooley, aka The Joke Doctor, a stand-up comedian, writer, and comedy tutor, didn't hesitate at all to attribute the way Mitch Headback came up with his jokes with drug use, as his jokes were normal everyday scenarios looked at from a different perspective. Jerry Cooley also advises comics not to do drugs, but to pretend that they are under the influence in order to come up with material. Whether drugs enhances creativity is a controversy that is yet to be resolved. But in his memoir, Stephen King, the infamous movie and novel writer, writes that he is skeptical of the myth associating substance abuse and creativity. But yet, before getting sober, King drank a case of beer a day and rode the Tominokas with cotton swabs stuffed up his nose to stem the coke induced bleeding. Which brings us to the question, do you think that drug use enhances creativity? I'm genuinely curious about this. If you have an opinion, do comment it down below. Moving on from his genius with the pen to his genius on stage, his comedy style was unprecedented and it is yet to be effectively replicated. Him and only him knew how to make it work. I mean, how many comedians do you know who would make a joke, say that, I know that joke was dumb, laugh and move on all together, all during a comedy special? Believe it or not, Mitch was quite shy and had stage fright. The fact that he wore dark sunglasses and always looked down during his performances is one of those things you can't quite unsee once you notice them. He would even completely shut his eyes during some of his performances. I've seen your act, actually, the day that they asked me if I wanted to do the interview with you. 
I saw you on Comedy Central Presents. Oh, yeah. And I thought it was absolutely hilarious. Thanks. And your delivery is completely different than anybody else I've ever seen. Uh, you just, you don't like do the whole setup of, you know, so I was walking down the street or whatever. You just like blurt stuff out. Uh, where does that come from? Uh, that just comes from, uh, you know, years of uh, trying to tell jokes and just uh, settling on a certain thing. I guess it's just whatever feels comfortable. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not a storyteller in real life. Uh -huh. So uh, I don't see the need to string my jokes in a story like fashion. Speaking of performing, if you read anything written about me, Chad Beck, having a cut like following is never left out. The audience would even finish his punchlines before he even got to them. If that made you say, hey, wait a minute, does this mean these people came to hear the same jokes? That's exactly what we mean by a cult like following. Anyway, let this reputation of jokes not be perceived as any form of laziness. Mitch wrote like a maniac, he will go on to perform 88 different jokes that were barely related in a single show. Speaking of hard work, an interviewer on Diamonds in the Roughly used the following analogy to summarize Mitch's work ethic. He said something about a particular day that he can't quite explain sparked a sudden intrinsic edge in him to cycle with his young son. They headed out and midway on the journey, when everybody was focused on what's on ahead, they started to go down a little hill where you get to lay back and enjoy a smooth coast. A moving shadow on the father's peripheral made him tilt his head to the right, and he saw his son pedaling like a maniac, breathing out loud like a tired dog. When he surprisingly shouted, Hey, there's no need for that. Relax, coast a bit. His son replied, Look ahead, Dad. If we don't build speed right now, we won't even make it to the middle of that hill. Pleasure to have you back. I was um, reading a comment uh, from your father, and uh, some of the stuff I was reading, it said, uh, uh, Arn had, Arnie, Arnie, right? Yeah, your dad? Yeah, yeah. So it's like burying a piece of coal, and it turns up a diamond later. Yeah. Now, why did he say that? And tell us about your uh, beginnings. <laughs> well, he tried to kill me, so he buried me alive, and then I got out and I made it. No, I didn't. Speaking of family, in 1991, Hedberg married Lane Shawcraft, a fellow stand up comedian. The marriage was done with no witnesses, and they didn't even tell anyone for a whole six months. They were always together and also went on the road together. Speaking of touring, Mitch spent the vast majority of his career on the road, and just like any comic, he can testify its brutality. Comedian Jimmy Pardo summarized it as, Well, what I would do for years was drink like an a-hole. I would start drinking the second I got off stage and not stop until the bar closed. I then slept it off, got up, showered, ate, did a show again and ride back to the bar and repeated that every day. In contrast to what the audience see, touring is lonely and eating healthy is not practical. Mitch's wife also brought it on an interview, saying that she told Mitch that living on the road was both bad and unhealthy for both of them. Speaking of unhealthy habits, Hedberg passed on the 30th of March 2005 due to a drug overdose. This was two weeks before he appeared on the Howard Stern show, where they had a kind of a prophetic dialogue. Hedberg insisted, well, you know, I got the drugs under control now. Stan asked, do you? You know how to take them responsibly? Yeah, you know, just for the creative side of it. Strangely, when Mitch got asked as to how he would want to end his life, he replied, first I would want to get famous and then I would overdose. If I overdose at this stage in my career, I would be lucky if I made it to the back pages. Anyway, all I can say is that I used to love Mitch Hedberg. I still do, but I used to too.